Maria Ressa in Manila, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Let's start with your personal situation. You have, earlier this month, been convicted on this charge of cyber libel, as they're calling it. Has it changed things for you? Aside from the emotional roller coaster and the fact that we've crossed yet another divide, I think I'm pretty much on the same road I've been on for the last four years, which is really standing up for my rights, both as a Filipino and as a journalist. You're, you're on bail, and I think your legal team have said there will be an appeal. Do you, in any sense, feel frightened right now? I, you know, Stephen, I've gone through this. When you've been under attack for four years, as we've been, uh, there have been all these stages. It's like the stages of grief, right? In 2016, we were pummeled on social media, exponential attacks that are extremely visceral and, you know, takes you by surprise, the viciousness of it. And those same narratives in 2017 come out of government's mouths. Uh, President Duterte himself then began to equate journalists with criminal. And then in 2018, 11 cases and investigations. I was in and out talking to officials. And 2019, the filing of these cases, I have eight arrest warrants against me that were filed that year. That was only last year. And I was arrested twice, detained once, uh, I feel like Alice in Wonderland and I've, I'm down in a rabbit hole, I'm going out and I'm gonna walk out. This verdict that, that happened on cyber libel, a story we published before the law we allegedly violated uh, was even in effect, uh, cements, this cements it now, right? That 2016, they're, they're journalists or criminals in 2020, after the weaponization of social media, the weaponization of the law, now I'm convicted. That's the death of a thousand cuts of our democracy. There is no doubt that it is not just uh, you that has uh, suffered from repressive tactics coming from government agencies. We can all see that. But nonetheless, the notion that all sorts of uh, freedom of expression are now curtailed and eliminated in the Philippines surely isn't right. If one looks at your country today, there is still a multitude of diverse opinion across the spectrum of politics in different platforms on the media, not least Rappler itself. After all, your website hasn't been shut down. It continues to this day. It has millions of eyeballs on it every single month. The Philippines is not North Korea, nothing like. Well, who would want to be North Korea, right? In the end, the Philippines is also living under a, a climate of fear and violence. In fact, when I last interviewed President Duterte, when he was already president, I was one of four journalists he gave an interview to in December of 2016. I asked him that specifically. I said, you know, Mr. President, now that you're in charge of actually protecting the Constitution, is it necessary to use violence? And he said, yes, he said it's necessary to use violence and fear. So while you see what looks like a multitude of voices, imagine that those voices also have a Damocles sword hanging over their heads. During our pandemic, people were, based on their posts on social media, people were arrested. I think there's a good veneer of legality for all of these, but we've certainly felt the walls closing in. In order to be able to continue publishing as Rappler, look what I've had to go through. I'm not no, a criminal, I, I I'm just a journalist. And, and, and obviously my show is called Hard Talk, so I, I have to take seriously yes. the charges against you because as you've, yeah, indicated, absolutely. you've indicated that the libel is the least of it. You still face allegations of my goodness, what a list. Fraud, tax evasion, receiving money right. from the CIA. I mean, you could be in court for years and years to come. Um, well, let's. the only thing I can say is that these charges, the eight criminal charges I'm facing, fall into three buckets. The first is cyber libel. 
The second is securities fraud. And in that, we'll, we'll throw in foreign ownership or foreign control, something violating something called the anti-dummy law. And then the third is tax evasion. And again, just like the first case, we were charged with tax evasion about six months after we received a prize, a an award from the government for being a top corporate taxpayer. Then a little more than six months later, were tax evaders pushed on social media. And in addition to that, to make this charge, they actually had to redefine Rappler from news organization to a dealer in securities. You know, so sure, let's do hard talk. I I feel like as a reporter, as the as someone running a news organization, I give the government and the president the respect that the office demands, I think, you know, but the kinds of uh, death by a thousand cuts that we've had to absorb just to do our jobs, just to continue doing investigative reporting, I've never lived through anything like this. And I covered Southeast Asia's transition from authoritarian one-man rule to democracy, starting here in the Philippines in 1986. Maria Ressa, do you think the Filipino public care about your fate and indeed the fate of other journalists in your country? Because one looks at Duterte's approval ratings, they are consistently above 80% approval, uh, the kind of figure that other leaders around the world could only dream about. And the Filipino public are well aware of what he's doing to the press. I think there are two answers to that question. The first one is the kinds of the propaganda machine and how it uses technology to essentially uh, use it as a behavioral modification system. And I can explain that more later, but the propaganda is exponential and it lifts. Uh, when you hear President Duterte is the best, the, the, the defender of the poor, even though it's the poor who are dr dying in the drug war, right? So that's the first step. I think, you know, the age of social media, statistical surveys haven't been able to keep up with these shifts. Uh, the second one is, do people care Yes, and I can see that just based on what's happened. And I think this in particular in 2020, three things have happened. We've had a pandemic, the lockdown. We are just in our 14th week of a very security driven militaristic lockdown. Um, it's a lockdown when President Duterte has, has told Filipinos to stay at home. And he told troops that if they come out, if we break quarantine, he told them to, and this is a direct quote, he said, shoot them dead. Uh, that did happen. Almost more than 60,000 people have been arrested during this time period. And because we're locked down, I think there's been more introspection. The second is but, the but shutdown I'm going to stop you there, if I may, because well, you, you, it's fascinating what you're saying, but I'm just wondering where your evidence is, because I look at the latest uh, polling I can find in the Philippines. There's a company I'm sure you know well, Social Weather Stations, who are widely yes. respected, and their yes. uh, measurements suggest that the Filipino public as a whole approves still of President Duterte's campaign against illegal drugs. They still seem to favor him, despite all of the controversy about his latest anti-terror anti -terror law, which you and others have described as a fundamental threat to freedom of expression. That's the third one, right? That's yeah, the yeah, third so, one I was so, going to say, this anti-terror so bill. You have to get real in a way. Everything you say about what Duterte is doing is not deterring a really big majority of Filipinos from giving him their backing. I think you have to look at the surveys and actually talk to the people who do the surveys. And the biggest question you have to ask them is, how do you count for fear? So before we went into lockdown, this was a question I asked all the time because these surveys are done in the homes of people. They have their numbers, they know who they are, they're normally, uh, their names are given by their village chiefs, the barangay captains. How do you account for fear, right? So not, not, not saying that President Duterte isn't popular, because I think his homespun, this kind of, you know, the guy you want to have a beer with, the grandfather you want to have a beer with, that's the narrative. I think that's, that's appealing. Yes, it, but it, having well, said that, how do you count for fear? Right? Inter interesting and question. Now, and I'll tell you what that plants in my mind, a, a different idea about fear. Maybe for you, and let's be honest, uh, for a, a, a relatively elite personality living in a nice part of Manila, 
with perhaps more security than most Filipinos, it is easy for you to focus on the fre threats to freedom which you feel and the fear you talk about. But what about the other Filipinos whose fear is much more street level? It's much more about the insecurity. And your Rappler website has made a point of investigating the drugs war that Duterte has uh, initiated for the last three, four years. But the drugs yes. war, according to most Filipinos, has made their streets safer. Yes, they look at the fact that hardly any security personnel have been prosecuted for egregious use of violence, but they also look at the fact that thousands of drug dealers have been taken off the streets, and they like that. I think that's definitely the narrative, but if you dig deeper into the surveys, number one, and this is based on the UN report, one just released a few weeks ago, uh, you can see that the people who die in the drug war are the poor. And you can also see in those surveys, it's not just the social weather stations, it's also Pulse Asia, you can see that President Duterte's support among the poorest of the poor has dwindled significantly compared to the AB, the people who are wealthy, who can cut the deals. You know, I always say there are three things that really characterize living under the age of Duterte. You have to do one of these three things. The three C's, corrupt, coerce or co-op. And it isn't the poor that does that. In fact, I would say the poor suffers the most. So you look at this brutal drug war, depends on who you talk to. If you talk to the police, they'll say, oh, well, maybe about 6,000 to 7,000 people have died. They admit to that. And then you talk to the human rights groups and they say it's tens of thousands. Our own Philippine Commission on Human Rights places the number at 27,000. That was several months ago, right? So no, I think you have to look much deeper into the numbers, Let look at which of the demographics right. well, and look at who's winning and who's losing. Let me ask you a personal question and be brief if you can. Sure. As the boss of Rappler, which is known for its investigations, including of the drugs war, do you now yes. think very carefully before commissioning any reporter to dig into what is happening on the streets? I'm mindful that journalists have been killed this year. More than 100 journalists have been killed in the last couple of decades in the Philippines. It is dangerous being a journalist. Are you now fearful for your own staff? Hmm, that's a really good question. In a way, we've been forged in fire. And I think the biggest lesson we've learned in the last four years is that when there's a Damocles sword hanging over your head, if you let it affect you, then you've lost it. And what we've done is we've doubled down on our investigative reporting. We know it's really important. We know we have to do this now. So I don't actually make the, the assignments in Rappler, but what I see in our team is this renewed commitment. They're tireless. And we have a young team. You know, Rappler is about 100 people. We're 63% women. The median age is 23 years old. The reporter that President Duterte bullied, like he basically faced her down. She was like 26 years old when, when he did that. So no, I, I think that I don't have to encourage Rappler to do investigative reporting. I think they're doing it on their own. And all I'm trying to do is keep the sky from falling. Let's talk about international reaction and response to what is going on in the Philippines right now. We have international NGOs like Amnesty International uh, condemning what they call, quote, a policy of large-scale murdering, murdering enterprise, they call it. We had, as you said, the UN Human Rights Office report referring to near impunity offered to uh, Philippine security personnel. But what we also see is that consistently over the last four years, Donald Trump, for example, has referred to President Duterte as his friend. We see a very close relationship developing between Duterte and the Chinese government. And we see, for example, that the International Criminal Court, which appeared to be ready to investigate what was happening in the Philippines, has essentially been neutralized because the Philippines has refused to recognize its legitimacy. The international community, frankly, has let you down, hasn't it? I wouldn't say that. 
What I would say is that the Philippines is punching above its weight in terms of determining the geopolitical power balance. You know, it really is. It, it, when President Duterte took office by September, so he took office in May 2016. By September 2016, he was in Beijing and he announced the pivot of the Philippines, a key country in the South China Sea conflict, right? What we call the West Philippine Sea. He announced that the Philippines would pivot away from the United States to China and Russia. He tosses this in. Um, what's interesting is this, what happened when the United States pushed against uh, what was happening in the drug war. Last December, uh, the, the U.S. government actually took away the visa of the man who was who carried out the drug war. He was the Philippine National Police Chief. He's now a senator, Bato de la Rosa. They took away his visa under ARIA, and the Philippine government was so upset that they canceled part of the a military basis agreement that has gone for a long time. It, this is a very strong relationship in the past. So the visiting forces agreement, this the government canceled it. But here we go again. Uh, just this month, uh, the Philippine government gave notice that they were not going to cancel that, and it's back up. So, so my, point, to my say. point, well, you're making my point for me, that whatever the, the detail of difficulties, geostrategic difficulties in relationship between the United States and the Philippines, in the end, there seems to be a sort of brotherhood feeling between Donald Trump and Rodrigo Duterte. And it's not surprising, given that they are, you could argue, populists of a similar style. They have contempt for much of the media, which we've discussed. They both seem to see journalists, quote unquote, as enemies of the people. Of and the they people. both, it is true to say, have found a way of communicating through social media, through using Twitter and Facebook platforms in a way that politically is extraordinarily successful. I would agree with you. And I think part of what's important but let me first answer you that question that you asked, which is, uh, did it let me down? No, absolutely not. I, I understand the geopolitical power play at work here. But I think what you're seeing both in the Philippines and in the United States is very similar to what's happening in many democracies around the world, including in the UK. And this is the role of technology. Uh, Facebook is our internet in the Philippines. There's 71 million Filipinos. We spend the most time on the internet and on social media globally. And I, I think it's the fifth year running. That's uh, Hootsuite and We Are Social. That's their number. So what's happened is this kind of astroturfing of manufactured consensus, the manipulation of the public at mass scale using Facebook has happened here in the Philippines. You asked about the popularity of President Duterte. That's partly buoyed by a propaganda machine that we got clobbered for exposing in 2016. But, but Maria, Maria I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt because that's so in it. What you are suggesting is that democracy doesn't work anymore. If you are talking about, quote unquote, manipulated public opinion, as you've just done, then you're undermining and delegitimizing the notion that the people have a right to choose their governors. If you're saying that their opinions are somehow fake or false, where is democracy? That's exactly what I'm saying, that democracy is essentially dead. And part of what killed it are social media platforms that are that have become behavioral modification systems. If you look at what's happened all around the world, starting in 2017, studies have shown that cheap armies on social media are cutting down democracy, rolling it back. In 2017, it was in 27 countries. In 2018, that doubled. In 2019, it was up to 70 countries. And these are different research studies, right? But so this is, this is dangerous territory. Right now, this is, if I may say so, well, dangerous but, territory, because you're sure. suggesting to me that uh, President Duterte, in the end, is illegitimate and doesn't have a mandate when patently- No, on that's paper, not what I'm saying. This man has that's, an extraordinary mandate. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, first of all, he doesn't have an extraordinary mandate. He was one of five presidential candidates. He had out of 61 or 62 million voters, he had 16 million votes. That's what elected President Duterte. That's okay. Of five, he won, he won the majority of the five, right? But beyond that, what I am saying is that 
the new information ecosystem actually allows lies laced with anger and hate to spread faster than facts. When a lie is told a million times in today's age, when I am attacked a million times with criminal, 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 it becomes a fact. And this is what's wrong, because if you don't have integrity of facts, you cannot have integrity of markets, and you certainly can't have integrity of elections. This is the problem with democracy. A final thought then. I'm very mindful that you returned to the Philippines from the United States after the people power revolution of, I believe it was 1986, and you made your life in the Philippines after that. And there was so much hope around then of a different kind of politics in your country. Here's what one uh, Filipino lawyer who moved to Australia recently has written, Jason Lamchek. He says, in terms of corruption, the post-people power governments became indistinguishable from the Marcos re regime. The only difference was the rhetoric of human rights and democracy, which people have increasingly come to regard as a sham. Isn't that the truth, that Duterte is in power and, quote-unquote, so successful because the post-people power politics of the Philippines simply failed the people? I I think I would agree that post-people power was a failure. We had endemic corruption. We replaced one set of leaders with another who then created their own. I mean, you know, we've always said there are eight oligarchical families, but the difference is this, right? The trickle-down effect didn't trickle down. There was a perfect storm, and this happened globally. This is part of the reason you're seeing a trend back to a form of I would say almost fascism, right? Because liberal democracy didn't deliver its promise. But having said that, we should not be moving the other direction. And that is the challenge to every democracy here. Part of what's enabled that is social media. When the gatekeepers, the journalists, the news organizations used to be gatekeepers, we kept the public sphere. We all agreed on the facts. Now that the gatekeepers are tech companies, the abdication of that responsibility has had huge impact. And what we're seeing now is the growth of oh my gosh, I'm even going to say almost like fascism all around the world. And this is scary for me here in the Philippines because we're one of the first signatories for the UN, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And yet I see Filipinos, things I would have thought would have been unbelievable. Filipinos are saying it's okay to kill. Filipinos saying that, uh, you know, democracy doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't. But I guess this is where I would like to see Filipinos weigh in. You know, we, we shouldn't look away. We should make an active choice. And when you see your rights getting pushed back, when you, I personally saw my rights being violated when that happens, are we going to accept that? Because then that will fundamentally change democracy. So Maybe we should. Yeah, so we have to end, but I'm just thinking, never mind the threat of prison now hanging over your head, you continue this fight. It's not just about prison. The journey is the battle because I think there's so much more at stake. If it was just me, I would, you know, I'd be quiet. Why not? But there's so much at stake for us right now. I became a journalist in 1986 and I'm a journalist today. I am at my most senior and I want to make sure that I do the right thing for democracy, for journalism. Maria Ressa, thank you very much indeed for being on Hard Talk. Thanks for having me.